Here's an idea. The organic movement has been successful because of our aversion to dirt and growing comfort with sterility. In New York, we have these little groceries on many street corners. We call them bodegas, and they provide a limited selection of staple food products, mostly canned or boxed groceries, and usually a friendly cat to hang out with. When I moved to New York, they all kind of looked like this, which is actually around the corner from where I get my hair cut, but more and more over the last 10 or so years, they've started looking like this, which is in my neighborhood. Please note the ODB mural next to the organic grocery. If that is not a great metaphor for Brooklyn's identity crisis, I don't know what is. Of course, many bodegas' gradual transition from neighborhood food shack to well-lit organic grocery may be the result of gentrification, the change in urban landscape which results from an influx of middle and upper middle class residents, and that'll eventually get its own Idea Channel episode. Today, I want to talk about the more granular topic of organic food, a huge movement happening around the globe of which the transformation of my local grocery is but one tiny symptom. Now, it wasn't until the early 20th century that farming became not organic, and it became so quickly. Pesticides, man-made fertilizers, genetically engineered food, irradiation, a whole herd of generally sort of not awesome seeming farming practices became normal, at least as far as the food you get in the grocery store is concerned. It's probably worth mentioning the fact that I see the local food movement as being related but distinct from the organic food movement. By the 1930s, some scientists started asking, hey, maybe this stuff not so good? in the food? But it wasn't until the 1970s, with the recognition of pollution as a serious global problem, that non-organic farming practices started getting the side eye. By the 1980s, the USDA had officially recommended organic farming practices for reasons of sustainability. Further concern amongst the public about the well-being of farm animals, fair trade practices, biodiversity, and human health all watered the soil, which led the organic movement to sprout. Of course, there is still lots of information out to pasture. Okay, I will stop. It's still a bit unclear, at least as far as human health is concerned, how good organic food really is for you. Or maybe the inverse, how bad non-organic food is. The GMO debate, for instance, is huge, and I am not qualified to speak on it at all. So here is a brief statement from PhD biologist, Mr. Tall, handsome Dr. Joe Hansen. I'm Joe Hansen, and thousands of research studies to date have demonstrated that genetically modified organisms are safe for humans and animals to consume. That hasn't stopped the EU from passing intense GMO regulations from lots of people and certain food chains swearing off GMO sources entirely. Many people generally feel like it is better to be eating organic, even if it costs the average American household 4,000 extra dollars per year to do so. Source. And that is the part of this that I find really interesting. The feels, the organic feels. Organic, amber, feels of grain. I'm so sorry. Because really, it's those feels which are leading every bodega in Brooklyn to trade their bright yellow and red tin signs for green awnings and broccoli logos. Even and especially if it is exactly the same bodega on the inside, they just started selling like Odwalla juices and have an apple. Whether people know if or how organic food is better, and a bunch of research has shown that they don't, boop, they tend to think it is anyway. Why might that be? Easy, some people will say. Chemicals are bad. Do not put them down your gullet. The problem with this attitude is, as Hank Green put it so succinctly, Everything is chemicals! Really, I think it has less to do with chemicals specifically as it does with the feeling that a boundary has been crossed. Let's talk about dirt for a second. In her book Purity and Danger, Mary Douglas talks lots about dirt and the rituals we have surrounding cleanliness. She says that nothing is, in and of itself, dirty. Things are always dirty in relation to other things or their context. Sneakers aren't dirty on our feet, but they're dirty on the kitchen table. Used dishes are more dirty in the bedroom than they are in the sink. 
Dirt, she says, is, quote, matter out of place, something put where it does not belong. And while we tend to think of our revulsion to softened fruit, feet on the table, or bodily detritus as being grounded in scientific knowledge about the spread of microscopic sickness causing wee beasties, it turns out that these revulsions are more often than not based in cultural ritual than actual potential sciency harm. I see this as being the case with organic food, too. In the United States, as much of the world, there is some romanticizing of good, old-fashioned farming. Not that factory farming stuff. I mean salt of the earth, working with your hands, from farm to table, honest labor, etc., etc. The farmer is, to many, a kind of mythic hero providing for his peers, and the actions which comprise farming, like the actions which comprise much of our daily hygiene regimen, are not unlike ritual. To interfere with that ritual, to introduce chemicals into this beautiful, natural, productive process is then taboo, to use Douglas's term. Specifically, the attitude that any foreign chemicals which find their way into that process are pollutants. They are matter out of place, and the food is therefore dirty. And as we all know, what is not pure is dangerous, and what is pure is virtuous. We see this all throughout our culture. Myths of purity related to virginity, calling anything of a sexual nature dirty, saying people have filthy mouths, assumed relationships between a disorder and a lack of hygiene or worse, mental stability, saying people clean up nice, and describing that which is thoughtfully constructed as polished or tidy. Modern practices and concepts of design, especially digital or technological and industrial, have constant aims to minimize, if not simplify, to clean things up a little bit. It's not that thoughtfulness and minimalism are bad, only that their association with cleanliness has always struck me as strange and as reinforcing what has always seemed a growing desire for, or maybe preoccupation with, sterility. Which, I mean, let's talk about hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer is everywhere. That's no joke, it is Dial's actual marketing campaign. And an actual problem. The FDA is asking for new research on the long-term effects of exposure to antibacterial products due in part to the apparentness of its constant use. Triclosan and triclocarbon, for instance, found in some antibacterial products may contribute to the increase in antibacterial resistant microbes. The World Health Organization is concerned about the overuse of broad-spectrum antibiotics on both humans and livestock for similar reasons. In our discomfort with pollutants in all of their forms, we do not hesitate to clean. But what if, because of the cleaning, the beasties become less we and turn into just beasts? I'm not saying that medicine is bad. Rather, as Paracelsus said on a recent episode of It's Okay to Be Smart, the dose makes the poison. Writing for Time, Bill Saperito sees the obsession with cleanliness as being particularly American. America has long been a sanitation nation, he writes. Over the past couple of decades, consumer products companies have found a target-rich market in exploiting this history of germ aversion. They have launched wave after wave of microbe-seeking toilet bowl cleaners, dish detergents, mouthwashes, and no doubt, floor polishes. He sees the desire to be clean as a result of our ancestors' desire to escape squalor for a better life. To be clean is the American dream. I don't know if I buy it. I don't even think it's particularly Western. The world over, for all of time, people have had rituals to maintain cleanliness, to ward off taboo. We are no different, it's just that now there are more of us, and some of our rituals have a foot in science. Also, we have things like global markets, manufacturing and shipping capability, genetic engineering, economic pressure. Anything that we want bad enough we get it. So whether or not it means anything health-wise, organic food feels right because we believe it to be unpolluted. It's the closest we can come to clean, maybe even sterile food, a quality we've come to value in so many other facets of our lives. Why not what we eat? But even that is a whole thing that we could call into question, the actuality of organic food's organicness. But we're already at 1,500 words and I have to get home for my dinner of chemicals.
What do you guys think? What accounts for all of these good feelings around the organic food movement? Let us know in the comments and I will respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts related to, I'm very sorry, Minions. If you want to watch that, and why wouldn't you, you can click right here. This week's episode was brought to you by the hard work of this 100% organic production crew. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit links in the doobly-doo. And the tweet of the week comes from Grash Uriza, who points us towards a story about trees with email addresses that filled me with joy. It's, yeah, it's great. Oh, and one more thing, this week, VidCon, I'm there, my schedule, doobly-doo, come hang out in Anaheim with me, I'm in Anaheim. I mean, not right now, I'm not in Anaheim, but when you see this, I will be in, you get it, you understand completely what I'm saying. <laughs>